Welcome to everyone. Uh, those of you who are listening for a while uh, heard a traditional kimah that um, was composed by Rabbi Chaim Sabato uh, about the destruction of the Jews of Europe in the Holocaust. I want to welcome everyone. My name is Rabbi Eli Merfeld. I'm the CEO of the Zuckerman Holocaust Center. And I want to thank you all for joining us for this program, an American rabbi in Buchenwald. We thought it would be a particularly appropriate to have this discussion on Tisha B'Av, which is a day dedicated to mourning the losses of the Jewish people. I want to thank our program supporters, Robin and Leo Eisenberg, Joan Sheriff Epstein and Robert Epstein, Razan Gitlin, Lisa Goldstein, Gary Cappy, Sis Mizell, and Renee and David Silbert. A special thank you also to our community partner, Quality Kosher Catering. I would ask now to introduce our special guest, Dr. Rafael Madoff. Uh, Dr. Medoff is a founding director of the David S. Wyman Institute for Holocaust Studies in Washington, D.C., and is the author of more than 20 books about the Holocaust, Zionism, and American Jewish history. Dr. Medoff has taught Jewish history at The Ohio State University, Purchase College of the State University of New York, and is a fellow of the Finkler Institute of Holocaust Research at bar Ilan University. After Raphael's presentation, there will be a Q&A session so as the program progresses, please write your questions in the Q&A section located at the bottom of your screen. Rafael, welcome and thank you for being our guest this afternoon. Maybe it'll help us focus on the meaning of the day rather than on the lack of eating and drinking. Thank you, Rabbi Mayerfeld. Um, and let me also add my thanks to Liz Pintella and the rest of the staff at the Zeckelman Center and to the sponsors who have generously made it possible for us to have today's program. I'd like to begin by sharing with you um, a very brief audio clip of Rabbi Herschel Schachter. Rabbi Herschel Schachter explaining in his own words what he saw when he entered Buchenwald on the day of its liberation by his army units on April 11th, 1945. So we're going to hear Rabbi Schachter some years later describing his experiences. And as we hear his voice, we're going to be looking at a series of Polaroid photos, snapshots that were apparently taken by Rabbi Schachter's assistant and driver during those first minutes after liberation. I found these photographs in Rabbi Schachter's personal papers as I was researching um, what became the biography of Rabbi Schachter, the Rabbi of Buchenwald. Uh, I should mention that some of the photographs um, contain rather jarring images, as you might imagine, from the first hours after the liberation of a Nazi concentration camp. All but one of these photographs have never been published before. The very last photo in the, in the series you may recognize, um, it's a photo which actually has uh, young Elie Wiesel in those barracks in 1945, and as a result, that photo has appeared widely. But the other photos preceding that um, have never never been published before. So we're going to take a look now at those photos and listen to Rabbi Schachter's brief recollection in his own voice, and then we'll continue. The terrible day in my life was April 11, 1945. It was on that day that as a young American Army chaplain, I served with frontline troops across Europe, and then, precisely on that day, came upon the infamous, notorious Buchenwald concentration camp. I had heard nothing of Buchenwald until that day. It was only my sad experience to have seen, to have participated in the ravages of war to have seen city, cities laid waste and homes destroyed and human beings crushed. But especially do I consider it a privilege, tragic and grievous though it was, to have come face to face with the stark, bitter, sordid reality of Jewish tragedy. As I mentioned a moment ago, I came upon this hellhole called Buchenwald within a matter of hours after the first columns of American tanks rolled through and 
liberated that dungeon on the face of this earth. I do indeed consider it a privilege, tragic, sad, to have been among those who literally opened the gates of hell, the crematoria. I saw hundreds of human bodies strewn in front of the ovens that were still hot, the smoke still curling upward, waiting, waiting to be shoveled into the furnaces. How can any human being ever forget such a sight? I stood there in front of those hot ovens, my eyes riveted to that view. I, I, I must tell you that whenever I even attempt to repeat this story, to relive that moment, it is exceedingly difficult to do so. I ran to seek out Jews, to find Jews who were still alive, and indeed there they were in a long series of low barracks. I ran into one after another, and there again, no matter what we have seen or heard, believe me, there simply are no words in the human vocabulary that can even remotely attempt to describe the horrors, the brutal, inhuman horrors that were perpetrated against our people. Within this huge Buchenwald camp, there was one area that was called Das Kleine Lager, the small camp that was reserved especially for the brutal treatment of Jews. I went into those barracks and there I saw just raw planks of wood shelves on which were strewn scraggly, stinking straw sacks. And there they were looking down at me. Men, a few boys, there were no women in Bochumwald. But I will never forget those eyes, haunted with fear, half crazed, emaciated, more dead than alive. Spontaneously, intuitively, I felt the only language that I could speak that most of them would understand was Yiddish. And I called out, Shalom Aleichem, Yidin, here's and Fry. You are free. The war is over. And there they were looking out at me through incredulous eyes. But again, I can't continue. I could go on and on. But from that moment, I must tell you that my life changed. The impact of that experience was enormous on the whole course of my career. I want to describe now a little, a little about Rabbi Schachter's background, his personal background and his experiences as a, as a World War II Army chaplain. And then, um, and then talk about how that experience transformed his subsequent career as an American Jewish leader. As you'll see, the Book and World experience shaped and affected Rabbi Schachter's professional trajectory in a number of not so surprising ways, but also in one very unexpected way that I want to share with you. Herschel Schachter was uh, an Orthodox rabbi. He grew up in, in Brooklyn. At the time that World War II began, he was uh, ministering to his first congregation in Stamford, Connecticut. Like all uh, rabbis and other clergymen, Schachter was technically exempt from military service. Nonetheless, he volunteered and he enlisted um, of his own volition in 1942. Um, and at first was stationed at a number of relatively um, comfortable uh, sites. He was uh, sent to uh, New Orleans and then the Caribbean. And, um, and he could have remained uh, in Puerto Rico, actually through the rest of the war had he chosen to, um, and yet he was driven by his conscience to seek a transfer to the European battle zones. Think about that for a moment. Um, he, 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 couldn't, he couldn't feel at peace with himself 
if he remained in relative comfort, safety um, in the Western Hemisphere, in, in the, in, in, he would have been stationed in Puerto Rico, most likely. Instead, he asked to be sent. And in fact, at first, the army resisted, and he had to really lobby to get, him, to get permission to go to Europe. And he put himself directly in harm's way. This was among the, the many interesting aspects of Rabbi Schachter's life with which I was not acquainted when I began researching his life, um, but which I was um, uh, surprised and interested to discover. It happened um, that Rabbi Schachter was assigned to, um, to General Patton's army, and by chance, Schachter's unit was the one that came upon Buchenwald. When I say came upon, what I mean is the chaplains um, and the other soldiers who served uh, in America's military forces were never told by the senior military leadership that they were uh, they could expect to encounter uh, the the remnants of Nazi concentration concentration camps or death camps and actual survivors. Details about the Nazi camps were by the end of the war, in fact, by the middle of the war, well known to both the political leadership in the Roosevelt administration and the top brass in the military. But the information was not shared with the commanders and soldiers on the ground. So what Rabbi Schachter and his uh, fellow soldiers encountered when they reached Buchenwald came as a complete, complete shock. Rabbi Schachter was not the only American army chaplain to personally encounter Holocaust survivors. There were, of course, hundreds of chaplains, uh, Jewish chaplains, Orthodox, conservative, and reform, serving um, in all, all of the mil military fronts during World War II. And there were a number of other uh, of chaplains who also uh, assisted Holocaust survivors. Uh, my friend and colleague Michael Trazen and I were just discussing the other day some of the activities of the late Rabbi Herbert Eskin, who a number of you may may have known or recognized the name because um, of his long service as a rabbi in the Detroit Jewish community. Uh, rabbi Eskin um, encountered Holocaust survivors, survivors of slave labor camps in the area of Stuttgart, and he provided housing and food for them, sometimes in defiance of his military superiors. Rabbi Schachter's experience was unique, however, because he was the only U.S. Army chaplain who remained in a liberated Nazi concentration camp, and he did so for nearly two months. That's remarkable in, in several ways. First of all, Rabbi Schachter's um, job was to uh, minister to the needs of uh, Jewish soldiers, American Jewish soldiers, not European um, Holocaust survivors. He arranged religious services for, um, for soldiers. He counseled them in personal matters. He assisted them in a variety of ways. That was his job. So in asking his commanding officer for permission to remain in Buchenwald, he was really going far beyond what his actual um, official tasks were. Nonetheless, fortunately, um, his commanders saw fit to grant him permission. He remained in Buchenwald um, from April 11th for, for the next approximately two months. Let's keep in mind what that meant in terms of Rabbi Schachter's personal well-being. Buchenwald, like all of the other liberated Nazi sites, was a place of, um, of devastation, of disease, of, um, of people who were, who were, who were uh, survivors who were profoundly emaciated, um, many of whom continued to die in the first days and weeks after liberation. Um, because of the, of the starvation and the disease that they encountered. So Rabbi Schachter was thrusting himself into a situation where, first of all, he could have, been, he could have found himself afflicted with one of several contagious diseases. Um, and in general, it was a, this was an incredibly um, shocking and stressful situation for a young man from Brooklyn who had never experienced anything even remotely like um, what he was encountering. It happens that Rabbi Schachter was raised in a Yiddish-speaking household, so the fact that he was fluent in Yiddish was a great asset to him in terms of communicating with the survivors. During those long weeks that he spent in Buchenwald, um, Rabbi Schachter 
labored to bring a sense of renewed life to Holocaust survivors. He organized um, religious services. Several uh, among the major uh, occasions that took place during this period was the holiday of Shavuot, um, which was very soon after liberation. And for the Jews in Buchenwald, this was the first, this the first time that they had prayed together in a, a normal Jewish religious service in years, of course. In addition to having regular religious services, Rabbi Schachter was, became deeply involved in trying to help the survivors reconnect with members of their families who had survived elsewhere in Europe. He wasn't actually allowed um, to, um, to pass on their messages to their loved ones or to the Red Cross. So the way he did it was he took all the letters that survivors would write, he put them in a, um, in a, in a mail sack as if it was his personal mail that he was sending back, um, back home. Um, and then when the letters reached, um, reached his family in Brooklyn, then they were sent on to their proper um, destinations. Rabbi Schachter, his, to his credit, um, bent a lot of rules during those weeks in Buchenwald because he felt it was necessary for the survival of, of the Jews um, of Buchenwald. In one um, remarkable instance, when the government of Switzerland agreed to take several hundred Jewish children from Buchenwald and to resettle them uh, in, in Switzerland, um, Rabbi Schachter encountered a very harsh Red Cross official who was disqualifying many of the would-be passengers for this children's train on the grounds that they did not appear to be um, younger than 16 years old. Now, of course, these children had no proof of their age, and many of them did look older because, as, as a result of the ravages of, of illness and, and starvation, um, their appearance was as if they were, they were older. And Rabbi Schachter physically smuggled children onto that train and deceived the Red Cross official and, and others um, and, the, and the train guards in order to, to bring onto the train many more children than were allowed. Now, moving ahead um, into the Buchenwald, past the Buchenwald experience and into the ways in which this remarkable um, episode in Rabbi Schachter's life affected his future, I want to begin by noting that um, Herschel Schachter did not begin his public life imagining himself as a major Jewish leader, certainly not someone of national stature. Um, but when he returned from um, the war, instead of immediately going back to his old pulpit in Stanford, Connecticut, um, he began a nationwide speaking tour where he went from uh, state to state all throughout the, the U.S. speaking to Jewish audiences and sometimes non-Jewish as well um, and sharing with them his eyewitness testimony uh, of what he had seen at Buchenwald. This was very important because in those days, before there was email, before there was CNN, um, information about what had gone on in the camps and what was happening to the remaining survivors was hard to come by. It was fragmentary. Um, it was not always reliable. Yet here was an American rabbi speaking to audiences about what he had personally seen. So Herschel Schachter became a, a, a vitally important um, eyewitness to the suffering that Jews had endured under the Nazis. And, and I emphasize, to the goal uh, of creating a Jewish state to which these survivors could then immigrate. This was the a driving theme of Rabbi Schachter's speeches that um, in the wake of the Holocaust, the Jews needed their own homeland, their survivors wanted to go there, and justice required um, that it happen. After um, close to a year of public speaking and, and, and finally beginning to sort of feel his oats as a public speaker and as a, a person um, of some stature in the Jewish world, Herschel Schachter then returned to his pulpit in Connecticut for a short time and then subsequently took up uh, another pulpit, this one in the Bronx uh, in New York, where he then was to remain for, for the rest of his professional life. At the Mashalu Jewish Center, Rabbi, Fact, Rabbi Schachter found um, a group of lay leaders who understood that Schachter's experience during the Holocaust made him a unique figure in the Jewish world, and they wanted him to be out in the public eye, 
and to um, and to and to use his skills as an orator to communicate important uh, messages of Jewish national survival and Jewish unity. And and so it was that in the um, 1950s, as Rabbi Schachter became increasingly involved in Jewish organizations, especially Orthodox organizations such as the Rabbinical Council of America, it was, I suppose, almost inevitable that um, Orthodox leaders would turn to Rabbi Schachter in 1956 when a new, an unusual opportunity arose to send a delegation of rabbis to the Soviet Union. This was the first time um, since the Communist Revolution um, in Russia 40 years earlier this was the first time that a delegation of American rabbis had been given permission to enter the Soviet Union. Rabbi Shachter was part of this small group. I want to share with you now a photograph of, um, of Rabbi Shachter delivering a sermon in the Great Synagogue in Moscow. This was a scene, as you can imagine, of, of great emotion and power. Thousands of Russian Jews who had not who had, not ever, had never seen an American rabbi and had been cut off from the rest of the Jewish world for decades as they were able to encounter um, this remarkable uh, phenomenon of an Orthodox rabbi speaking to them. And you can see Rabbi Schachter there in the center of the photo. He has a goatee and a, and a black hat. Um, speaking in Yiddish, of course, there was, that was the common language, um, and giving Russian Jews a sense of hope um, and, and most important, a sense that they had not been forgotten. Rabbi Schachter and the other members of his delegation spent, um, spent uh, close to four weeks in the Soviet Union, traveling from city to city, delivering classes, preaching in their in synagogues, um, and have, making personal contact with Soviet Jews, taking messages from them that Rabbi Schachter and his colleagues smuggled back to the United States to their loved ones um, and, and forging for the first time a, a bond to an East European Jewish community um, which had believed it had been forgotten by the rest of world Jewry. That was in the summer of 1956. This is before there was an organized Soviet Jewry protest movement in the United States or elsewhere. Um, historians um, might indeed a profit from considering that that trip behind the Iron Curtain in 1956 in some ways helped plant the seeds of what would become in just a few years later um, a major protest movement in the American Jewish community for Soviet Jewish freedom. Not long afterwards, only about six months later, Rabbi Schachter received an unexpected call from the U.S. State Department. He was told that because of the, um, the revolution Un, uh, then, then going on in, in Hungary that thousands of Hungarian Jews were clamoring to leave and many had been given permission to come to the United States and they asked Rabbi Schachter to travel um, to Europe to go back to Europe and to um, help bring those Hungarian Jews um, to freedom to the United States I want to show you a, a photograph now of, um, from the ship that uh, Rabbi Schachter traveled on. You see him here in the middle with the glasses. You see him in the kitchen um, of, the, of, the sh of the ship from Hungary, surrounded by a number of the Hungarian Jewish refugees. Rabbi Schachter, among other things, made sure that the kitchen was kosher, because a number of these, of the Hungarian Jews, were personally um, observant. They were Orthodox Jews, and keeping kosher was important to them. And so once again, Rabbi Schachter had the uh, remarkable and unique um, experience of being able to, to bring hope and um, chizuk, strength, to an East European Jewish community cut off for so many years from the rest of the Jewish world. These experiences in the Soviet Union and Hungary resulted in Rabbi Schachter increasingly being seen on, uh, in, the, in the American Jewish community as a potential national leader. Now, I should emphasize here that until this point, um, Orthodox Jews in the United States did not hold positions of leadership in secular Jewish organizations. Of course, Orthodox rabbis like Schachter were prominent in Orthodox groups like the Rabbinical Council of America and others, but um, 
But Orthodox Jews were still seen as kind of a, um, as, as a community on the margins, as not necessarily suited for national leadership. Um, but Herschel Schachter was um, again and again proving himself to be someone capable of more than simply Orthodox leadership. It was one more important overseas mission that he served uh, in the 1950s. And this was in 1954, actually, slightly, uh, 55, it slightly predates the others that I've mentioned. There was a controversy in Jerusalem. This will sound all too familiar to us even today. It was a, a dispute in Jerusalem because a secular youth club had been opened on the edge of the Orthodox neighborhood Mea Sharim. That resulted in protests uh, by Orthodox Jews in, um, we would today describe them as Haredi Orthodox Jews in Jerusalem, some of which turned into riots. And in an attempt to uh, bring peace to that situation, the Rabbinical Council of America asked Rabbi Schachter to fly to Jerusalem and to try to mediate between the two sides. Here's a photograph of, of Rabbi Schachter with the, the then Prime Minister of Israel, Moshe Sharet. Um, Schachter discussed the situation with the Prime Minister, with the Mayor of Jerusalem, with representatives of the Haredi rioters, with, with representatives of the organizers of the youth club, um, and eventually he succeeded in brokering a decision which remarkably was more or less satisfactory to all sides. This will segue somewhat into the point I'm going to make about how the Buchenwald ex uh, experience affected Rabbi Schachter. Again and again in my research, I found that, that Schachter's natural personal inclination was to be a kind of a bridge builder. He often seemed to have one foot in several different worlds at the same time. Herschel Schachter was a modern Orthodox Jew. I want to emphasize that. He was not what we would today call Haredi. He was modern Orthodox, and yet he had close, friendly relationships with a number of leading Hasidic and other Haredi rabbis, including the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Satmar Rebbe, um, and other, other prominent um, rabbinical figures from that world. Um, at the same time that he moved easily with secular Jews, secular Israeli political leaders, and with non-Orthodox Jews here in the United States. In 1968, Herschel Schachter was chosen to be the uh, chairman of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. He was the first Orthodox rabbi to ever hold that position. The conference is, of course, the umbrella for the dozens of major Jewish groups in the United States. Rabbi Schachter was both paving the way for American Orthodox Jews to assume a more prominent role in Jewish communal life, but he was, also, he was also a kind of a model for a new type of Orthodox leader, one who was not content to simply remain in his insulated uh, Orthodox world, but who, who was, wanted to uh, share his skills, his talents, and in Schachter's case, his, his great skills at communication with the entire American Jewish community. He was able to represent all of American Jews when dealing with the kinds of public figures with whom the Conference of Presidents interacted. Presidents, prime ministers, diplomats, um, the international news media. Rabbi Schachter distinguished himself again and again as a, a leader of, of national stature. During the two years that he served as chairman of the Conference of Presidents, much of Rabbi Schachter's attention was focused on um, Israel facing pressure from the United States government, that is the Nixon administration, um, to make one-sided concessions to the Arabs. This, this uh, period in which Rabbi Schachter helped mobilize public and congressional pressure against the Nixon administration leaning on Israel, this period, um, among other things, resulted in, in Herschel Schachter for the first and only time becoming the subject uh, of a political cartoon, something that amused him greatly in which, um, in which kind of summed up, um, he felt, um, what he had been able to do in terms of trying to win over President Nixon to a more pro-Israel position. In this cartoon, which appeared in the Israeli daily Yediot Achronot, 
we see Rabbi Schachter on the left. Um, you see it says Harav Schachter on, uh, written on him, and he's holding a, a piece of paper which says on a chirum, uh, emergency. The emergency was that Israel was being pressured unfairly. You see Richard Nixon, uh, President Nixon, lifting his hat to reveal a yarmulke. And the caption at the top reads, Tamin Li, believe me, Rabbi Shagder, Zayasham Kol Azman. I was always pro-Israel. You just didn't entirely realize it. This is common, a, sort of a common um, tactic that presidents sometimes have used over the years, not just Nixon, to kind of blame it all on the State Department. Yeah, the pressure and the criticism was coming from those boys over at the State Department, but not me. I'm, you can trust me. Look, here's the yarmulke on my head, so to speak. Uh, Rabbi Schachter often described um, his leadership of the Conference of Presidents and his efforts on behalf of Israel um, as being profoundly influenced by his uh, experiences during the Holocaust, um, the importance to him of, uh, of making sure that Jews would never again be vulnerable and victimized. And not surprisingly, um, Herschel Schachter became active in the Soviet Jewry protest movement, which began in earnest in the United States um, in the early and mid-1960s. I'm going to show you a um, photograph um, of Rabbi Schachter and a number of his colleagues marching um, in Manhattan. One of many, many such protests. You can see him... In the middle of the picture, because Rabbi Schachter was a little shorter than most of his colleagues, so he's easier to spot. Um, and this is one of, of many uh, protests in which he was proud to take part. But more than just taking part in others, pro other uh, protests by others, uh, Rabbi Schachter also organized a Bronx division um, of the Soviet Jew Jewry protest movement. What we're looking at now is a poster um, of a rally held in the Bronx, which Rabbi Schachter uh, personally organized. This was in 1966. The, what, I, what I want to call your attention to, if you can zoom in um, on, your, um, on the, the names of the, the sponsor organizations, this is going to bring me to, um, to another major point I want to make about Rabbi Schachter and how Buchenwald affected his uh, the, the, the trajectory of his of his role as a Jewish leader. When you look at the list of co of organizations co-sponsoring this Orthodox rabbi organized rally, you see, first of all, the Central Conference of American Rabbis. That's the uh, Union of Reform Rabbis. You see the Rabbinical Assembly of America. That's the conservative rabbinical um, organization. And if you go down the list, you see uh, quite a few non-Orthodox groups. Rabbi Schachter was um, very proud of his ability to work with non-Orthodox Jews. He understood that, first of all, for a, um, for a political, movement, political pressure movement to succeed in the United States, it can't be um, a movement confined to one var very narrow part of the population. For the Soviet Jewry protest movement to succeed, it had to be obvious to American political leaders that the entire American Jewish community um, united behind the demand that something should be done by the United States to pressure the Soviet Union to allow Russian Jews to emigrate. So Rabbi Schachter, on a, on a political level, um, in bringing reform and conservative groups into um, his protests, recognized uh, the, the power um, as strategy. But also on a personal level, what I discovered in going through his correspondence and and interviewing people who knew Rabbi Schachter. He passed away before I began work on, on the book. But in speaking with people who knew him, it, was, it, it quickly became clear that he had close, genuine, personal friendships with many um, non-Orthodox Jews, with Reform and conservative rabbis whom he knew through the Conference of Presidents or through his subsequent work. After he f left the Conference of Presidents, he became chairman of the American Jewish Conference on Soviet Jewry, the major... Uh, Soviet Jewry uh, organization established in those years. So in his work um, with these important causes, he, a, he encountered non-Orthodox Jews and he formed genuine friendships. Now, this is interesting, again, because it would seem to be somewhat at, at odds with his background. 
someone who grew up in, in a very insulated Orthodox environment in Brooklyn in the uh, 1920s. He went to Orthodox schools as a youngster. For college, he went to Yeshiva College, the undergraduate division of Yeshiva University. For his rabbinical training, again, the Orthodox Rabbinical Seminary at Yeshiva University. And so he came from a very thoroughly Orthodox background from which he never departed um, throughout his life. And yet, and yet he was comfortable, indeed, very good at crossing boundaries. And here, here's where I want to suggest an unexpected way in which the Buchenwald experience may have shaped Rabbi Schachter. It seems to me that when he went into the military service, he went in um, not quite realizing what he was about to encounter. What I mean is, in the course of, um, of serving as an army chaplain, he was forced to make sort of various types of compromises and cut corners in different ways that he was not accustomed to doing as a rabbi in Stanford, Connecticut, or as a yeshiva boy in Brooklyn. Um, religious services had to be shortened because soldiers only had a limited amount of time. Um, there were different circumstances in which he simply had to do things in um, an unorthodox way, so to speak. And to give you one example, um, Rabbi Schachter was in, already on the European battlefront uh, when Passover arrived in uh, 1945. This was just before the, the liberation of Buchenwald. Now, as we know, Passover, the Passover Seder has to begin at nighttime since the Jewish religious calendar, a day begins on the night before. So for, pa for it to be Passover and to fulfill the mitzvah of eating matzah, you have to hold the Seder after dark, Passover Eve. Well, the problem for Rab that Rabbi Schachter immediately discovered was that um, his superiors would not allow him to hold a Seder in a lit in a, in a hole with lighting at nighttime because that would make it vulnerable to enemy attack. Therefore, he found himself in the peculiar position of having to hold a Passover Seder for Jewish soldiers before it was actually Passover. But he knew how much it would mean to them to have a Passover Seder. He also knew that most of the soldiers were not personally Orthodox and may not have even realized that it was problematic in any way to have a Seder before it was actually Passover. And so he did it. He knew it wasn't, he wasn't personally fulfilling that mitzvah of eating the Passover matzah at that moment, but it was a compromise made necessary by life and death situation on the battlefield. I want to share with you a photograph of, um, of Rabbi Schachter during his military service, which appears to be um, from the Seder that I just described. A lot of these photos, you can see it's another Polaroid photo, probably taken by Rabbi Schachter's assistant, like the ones we looked at earlier. They don't have dates or descriptions on the back, so it's left to the historian to be kind of a detective and try to figure out what's going on here. But if you look closely at, at um, for example, you see matzahs um, on the table there at the front, um, then we can assume this was, um, this was that Passover Seder to which I alluded. Rabbi Schachter in this photograph is seated. He has a talus around his neck. And by the way, that's another example, the kind of compromises he had to make. That's not the kind of talus that an Orthodox rabbi would usually wear. The customary Orthodox talus is much larger and it, not small to drape around one's neck in that way. But the army issued talus was much smaller because it had to fit in a little army kit bag and that was it. There was no way around it. And so Rabbi Schachter became accustomed to doing something that he had not previously, um, was not previously uh, familiar with doing. And so in describing to you and showing you these photos of his Passover experience, here I want to suggest something about how the army experience and Buchenwald um, may have affected Rabbi Schachter in an important way. In becoming chairman of the Conference of Presidents and building friendships um, across religious aisles, so to speak, with non-Orthodox rabbis, with secular Jews. Rabbi Schachter was very much breaking the mold of um, the typical Orthodox rabbi of that generation. But what I want to suggest is that 
um, his experience as a chaplain, even before Buchenwald, began to imbue him with a, with a sensitivity to the fact that sometimes it was necessary um, to compromise or to be flexible, let's say, to be flexible um, in different ways because of the needs of other people who are not like, just, were, not, were not just like him. They weren't rabbis. They weren't Orthodox Jews. Um, sometimes they weren't Jews at all. He, he dealt with, not, with Christian chaplains in the army, something, again, he had never experienced um, back in Brooklyn. And then, of course, in the Buchenwald experience, where Rabbi Schachter came face to face um, with the bitter reality that despite all of the differences and arguments between Orthodox and non-Orthodox Jews, between the religious and the secular, between Jews of different political factions, that in the end, sometimes, um, all Jews have a common fate. Tragically, that common fate was illustrated in the horrors of Nazi concentration camps like Buchenwald. But I think coming face to face with that and realizing on such a, a deep personal daily level how desperately needed unity was for the Jewish people. I think that um, that helped prepare Rabbi Schachter and, and influence him in a profound way for decades to come and made it possible for him to, to, to foster Jewish unity, to build bridges, to reach out and develop relationships with Jews of all kinds and with non-Jews, and not just for reasons of political strategy, although it was good strategy, but because he genuinely came to understand that in the end, um, unity of Jews is something which is precious and sadly all too rare in the Jewish world. But he did his best. He devoted his life in a very real sense to building that kind of Jewish unity. And as I, as I completed the research and the writing of the book, The Rabbi of Buchenwald, this was one of the important um, takeaways, so to speak, from studying his life and a lesson that I think we can all learn from the life and the legacy of Rabbi Herschel Schachter. Thank you. And I'll be glad to take uh, any questions that you have. Thank you. Uh, that was a fascinating talk, uh, Rafael. Um, if anyone has questions, we have a few that already came in, but if anyone has questions, if you press the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, uh, you, can, um, you can post them and we can get to them. Uh, first question is just a quick one from Helene. She wanted to know if that was with Patton's Third Army that he entered uh, Book and Bald. Uh, yes, it was. Okay. Um, then uh, your friend Michael um, asked a question, uh, um, and I'll compare. I'll, I'll combine it with someone else's question on the other side. He, he asked about um, uh, connections after the war. You talk about his work across communities. How about with some of the famous uh, conservative uh, orth, uh, reform rabbis uh, after the war, like uh, Abihel Silver and um, and uh, um, Stephen Wise? Was he involved personally with them uh, towards some of these later projects? Um, not them, but others. Rabbi Wise, for example, passed away in 1949. And Abihel Silver, um, Abihel Silver departed from the, the scene of national Jewish leadership um, by the late 1950s. Rabbi Herschel Schachter began uh, coming to prominence as a national figure somewhat later in the 1960s. Probably his closest relationship, Schachter's closest relationship with a non-Orthodox rabbi was with Wolf Kelman, the um, longtime executive uh, vice president of the conservative movement. In fact, Kelman um, actively lobbied for Schachter to become chairman of the Conference of Presidents of major American Jewish organizations. Um, but Kelman was far from the only um, non-Orthodox rabbi with whom Herschel Schachter enjoyed close personal relations. I should add, um, Schachter's relationships were um, with non-Orthodox rabbis were always cordial, friendly, even warm, but never involved him um, departing from his, um, his bedrock beliefs in the validity of Orthodox Judaism. But that did not stop him from having honest and open, um, frank discussions with non-Orthodox rabbis, often about their theological differences. Okay, on the second side now, you, you uh, mentioned the Satmar Rabbi Mababacher Rabbi in New York after the war. Um, how about in the DP camps? Was he involved at all, uh, Phyllis asks, with the Klosenberger Rebbe and the rebuilding of uh, some of the Hasidic uh, uh, groups after the war? Mm, not, not in Europe. Um, 
in the United States, Rabbi Schachter um, had warm relationships with a number of the Hasidic rebbe's um, who had resettled um, in the New York area. In fact, it was very common for him to go to a tish, a Hasidic tish, by one of the rebbe's, and simply not necessarily. Often he would he would sit in the back and just kind of, um, kind of um, draw in, um, kind of drink in the um, the environment. There was a kind of a um, it was kind of a Hasidic uh, flavor uh, to Rabbi Herschel Schachter's personality. There, are, you'll see in the book, he was one of the early pioneers of what we come to call the Kiruv movement, that is the Jewish outreach. In the early 1950s, when he was a young rabbi at the Mashallah Jewish Center, Rabbi Schachter and his wife Penina began hosting groups of teenagers at their home on Friday nights. This was rather unusual, again, very unusual for a modern Orthodox rabbi in those days. But some of those teenagers whom I interviewed for the book described the setting in the Schachter home as very much resembling a Hasidic tish. They said Rabbi Schachter would sit at the head of the table wearing a kind of a, um, a, velvet, um, a velvet overcoat, which somewhat <laughs> resembled what Hasidic rabbi, rabbis would wear. And that he would lead them in so, very spirited song and then divrei Torah. And the whole atmosphere to these teenagers um, was very, felt very profoundly Hasidic in its own way. And, um, and, and my, my feeling from interviewing other people who, who, who knew Rabbi Schachter was that that was, in a sense, his own, that was the Hasidic streak in him coming to the fore. Um, it's a whole interesting side of his life and work, which we didn't have time to discuss today, but which is... Um, presented in considerable detail in the book. Read the book, I understand. Um, is the book available in Hebrew? Uh, one of our visitors uh, asked. Uh, not yet. I hope it will be at some point. Uh, great. Um, so uh, uh, one of our board members, Steve, asks if uh, you know if Rabbi Shachter stayed in touch with any of the uh, book involved survivors who he first met at the camp uh, later in life. So this goes to another um, and broader subject of how the subject of the Holocaust gradually became prominent in the American Jewish community, but was not in the early years. And I trace this, among other ways, by noting the reunions of Buchenwald survivors. The very first time that Buchenwald survivors in the United States gathered together after the war was the 25th anniversary. 1970. During the 1950s, 1960s, the idea of having gatherings of Holocaust survivors simply was not very common. It wasn't unheard of, but not like it subsequently became in later years. And in general, the subject of the Holocaust was not widely discussed in Jewish public forums. It was to a limited extent, but not in any way approaching how prominent it later became. And I discuss in the book the reasons for that. So the 1970 reunion, so to speak, was attended by only 25 Buchenwald survivors, including Rabbi Schachter, of course, and was held in a small hotel room um, in Manhattan. By the time of the um, 50th reunion, 1995, it was a mass gathering of thousands of Buchenwald survivors and others at the site of the former camp with Rabbi Schachter, and many prominent political and religious leaders from around the world in attendance. So the difference between that tiny reunion in an old hotel room in 1970 and this gigantic gathering in 1995 in its own way illustrates how much um, the Holocaust had become a subject of, of, of significance in the American Jewish community and the world Jewish community in the ensuing years. Um, to switch uh, focus for a moment to the Soviet Union, um, one of our visitors asked if he ever returned uh, after that initial visit. And uh, second, uh, uh, one of our viewers is asking that initially amongst uh, organized Jewish uh, organizations, they did not think that the appropriate move was to protest against the Soviet Union, clearly based on the materials you shared, but I shafted and shared that opinion. Was he one of the ones who first started to to change public opinion on that matter? As to the first part of the question, uh, Rabbi Schachter and Rebbe Tim Penina did return to the Soviet Union um, twice in the 1980s when the when Soviet Union began to liberalize and it was more feasible for 
Americans and American rabbis to go there to meet with Soviet Jewish dissidents um, and to help them in various ways. Yes, they went back uh, twice. Um, as to the second part of the question, yes, the Soviet Jewry movement in its early years um, was a subject of some controversy in the American Jewish community, which I discuss in, in detail in the book. Um, there were those, uh, some in the Orthodox community and some beyond, who felt that public protests um, were inappropriate and, in fact, potentially dangerous, that they might provoke a backlash from the Soviet authorities. So when the first Soviet Jewry protest group arose, it did not come from the mainstream Jewish organizations. It was rather called the Student Struggle for Soviet Jewry. And it was established um, just that by students, many of them at Columbia University, um, led by Jacob Birnbaum and Glenn Richter. Herschel Schachter was among its early rabbinical supporters. Others were Shlomo Riskin, um, Yitz Greenberg, and other names that later became very well known in the American Jewish world. But at the time, these were considered the young radicals. It was 1964. Um, and although American society as a whole was beginning to experience student protests, this was something very new in the Jewish world. And it took some years for there to arise a real wall-to-wall -wall consensus in the American Jewish community that protests were good and right and necessary and effective. And Herschel Schachter's involvement, first with the student struggle for Soviet Jewry and then later with other Soviet Jewish or Jewry organizations, in some ways mirrors um, this, um, this changing attitude and acceptance by the community at large uh, of the need for public protests. Very interesting. Obviously, from you know the retrospective history, it's easy for us to sort of you know guess who 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 uh, had the right ideas when it started. But to be the first, obviously, is uh, it's hard. So it's impressive to understand that again, as you're pointing out, his work at the very beginning, at the end of the war, um, how how it colored his views on on how things could get done. Um, Rabbi, Rabbi Schachter often referred to his work in the Soviet Jewry movement as a natural continuation of the help he'd, he'd given to Holocaust survivors in Buchenwald. And he saw, as I, as I mentioned earlier, he saw um, the first and most important lesson of the, of the Holocaust, uh, that no Jew should ever stand idly by when other Jews were being persecuted in countries around the world. So for Herschel Schachter, the Soviet Jewry protest movement was very much a movement of never again, of never again would uh, Jews in the diaspora remain quiet while Jews were being mistreated around the world. So, so you just gave me an opening to mention a letter that was recently published uh, that he wrote in Hebrew to his parents. Um, I think we have a link to it we can post in the chat. Do you want to say a word about that letter? When, when Herschel Schachter first informed his parents um, in 1942 that he wanted to enlist, he encountered strong opposition. Um, his parents were immigrants from Eastern Europe. Um, they were um, intimately familiar with uh, persecution of Jews from their own uh, background. Um, and they were frightened, frankly, at the prospect of their youngest son. He was the, um, the youngest of eight children. And um, he, um, and he already had a professional position with exempt, which exempted him from military service. So from the point of view of his parents, he didn't need to go um, why, why should their youngest child have to put himself in harm's way? You can understand, of course, uh, you know, the anguish of parents in such a situation, and they tried to talk him out of it. We have in Herschel Schachter's files a poignant uh, handwritten letter in Hebrew that he sent to his parents explaining in, in great detail the reason behind his decision to enlist, and, um, and much of it revolves around these traditional Jewish concepts of not standing idly by. Um, here he said, my fellow, you know, my fellow Jews are fighting in, are, are in the army, fighting um, against the Nazis. Um, our brethren are being slaughtered in Europe by Hitler's forces. He felt it was his obligation as a Jew, uh, his religious obligation to join them and to, to be part of, of that struggle. Uh, his parents were unhappy about it, but what could they do? Um, in the end, they were not able to dissuade him. And he was always uh, very proud um, of his service. Of course, his parents were very proud of it as well. But like all parents, you know, they worried. 
they worried. And he wrote home frequently um, during the war, really as much as he could. When he was stationed in New Orleans than in Puerto Rico, he was able to write frequently, obviously much less so once he was transferred to Europe. He did not tell his parents that he was requesting a transfer to the battlefront, as you can imagine. Um, I have uh, four questions I'm going to combine uh, together. Uh, one was whether uh, he had ever, whether he writes or talked about uh, coming into contact with General Patton and his personal feelings of anti-Semitism. Um, the other questions are around his time in the camps. Did he visit any other DP camps or liberated camps? And then Edie asks um, if you could be a little more specific or perhaps another example um, that uh, Ali asks for a example of how he was assisting. You mentioned the, the transfer of the young uh, Jewish men to, um, to Switzerland um, and, the, uh, and the moving of, of letters to the United States. If there's another example you could perhaps share. Regarding um, Patton, no, I didn't find any references in the correspondence to um, or in his post-war interviews um, in which Rabbi Schachter referred specifically to General Patton. Concerning other camps, in the, in the uh, series of photographs we saw, the very first one showed a jeep with the word chaplain emblazoned on the front. Rabbi Schachter and his driver in that jeep periodically drove around the countryside outside where Buchenwald was uh, located, um, searching for other survivors. And they did encounter um, um, groups of, uh, of liberated slave laborers, Jewish slave laborers, um, who were found themselves um, you know, alone and abandoned in various, um, various places um, out in the country. And in one, in one case, they came to a small town and found um, dozens of Jewish women um, holed up in a house um, where they were short on food and, 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 and endured, of course, great suffering uh, until the Day of Liberation. He, he helped bring a lot of them back to, um, to Buchenwald, and, and they assisted um, a number of these um, of liberated slave laborers uh, in various ways. So they did what they could um, within the boundaries of what was possible. Um, Interestingly, by the way, during the same period, Rabbi Schachter continued to lead religious services for the GIs and to, um, and to counsel them in personal matters. So he tried to keep up his regular work while at the same time helping the Jews in Buchenwald and looking for other, other Holocaust survivors nearby. When we speak about Rabbi Schachter assisting the survivors in the camp of Buchenwald, let's keep in mind that for many, he was their interpreter. He sp they spoke Yiddish, they didn't speak English. They spoke Yiddish, they spoke you know, German and Polish and, and Russian, but they, few of them spoke English. So in addition to everything else, Rabbi Schachter was their intermediary to the soldiers um, from whom they were receiving, for example, medical attention. Um, and Rabbi, Sch uh, Rabbi Schachter uh, had to serve as their intermediary to, intermediary to Red Cross workers who were trying to reunify survivors with um, with their families uh, elsewhere in Europe. Um, and there were uh, countless ways, large and small, um, in, in, the, um, uh, my, in, in which Rabbi Schachter um, assisted the survivors. I had the good fortune to interview uh, a number of survivors who personally encountered Rabbi Schachter. And in many instances, they described his, what was most important to them in terms of the assistance he gave them was not simply bringing them a food ration or explaining to a doctor what was ailing them, but rather giving them a sense of hope and of, 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 of moral strength um, that it was possible to, to live and to, and to build a new life after, after the horrors they had experienced. At one point during the Buchenwald period, Rabbi Schachter helped arrange for the army to grant a large tract of land and some, and some old houses in a German town some miles away for young men and women from Buchenwald to establish what they called a kibbutz. They call, called it Kibbutz Buchenwald. And where they literally began a new life, uh, planting crops and training themselves in agricultural techniques because they were intending, and they did, um, eventually make their way to Palestine, to it was British mandatory Palestine before Israel was created. And so, the survivor, the, the veterans of Kibbutz Buchenwald, again, some of whom I was able to interview, um, 
literally experienced a kind of a rebirth. They began an entire new life, uh, something with Rabbi, which Rabbi Schachter was instrumental in helping to provide them. I want to thank you for a fascinating talk, Rafael. This has been really such an interesting discussion. I want to encourage everyone, really, if you have more interest, to take a look at the book, The Rabbi, A Book Involved. We put the link in the chat. We'll put it in there again. Um, I want to thank all of our program supporters, our donors. We're able to offer events like this free of charge because of the generosity of caring supporters. Like so many of you, I would ask you please to consider making a donation uh, by visiting our website at holocaustcenter.org. Uh, if you haven't had a chance, please stop by the museum. You can see our new special exhibit, To Paint is to Live, the artwork of Eric Lichtbaugh Leslie. We're open until five today, actually, if you wanted to come by. Um, Eric was imprisoned in the ghetto concentration camp of Theresienstadt, and he used art to express himself during his internment there with quite a sense of humor and, and to make some sense of the situation for himself. Miraculously, a lot of these pieces survived. We have over 130 of these paintings and sketches on display at the museum. So we welcome you to come by to see our core exhibit uh, or to see the special exhibit. Um, I wanna thank you all for participating and for joining us uh, and for your very probing questions. And I wish you all a, a meaningful day. Thank you.